and welcome to Fat Squirrel Speaks. Today is Thursday, March 14th. I am Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. Thanks for coming for a visit on this very all over the place, appropriately March day. We've gone from this room doing like almost black and me thinking, oh, I can't record today, um, to like having crazy sunshine. And now we're sort of somewhere in between. So thanks for coming over. Grab a drink. There's, oh, there's still sumos. I'm not questioning it. There's still sumos. Um, this week's episode will contain shenanigans, shameless self-promotion, knitting, stitching. I started to say spinning. That's not what it contains. And maybe some reading. We'll see how cohesive my brain can make thoughts happen. So that's not a good sign. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so shameless self-promotion. Let's do the business up front. We are a mullet episode. Uh, there will be a shop update Friday, March 15th, 9 p.m. Eastern time, fatscrollfibers.com. I have some like springy, gardeny, like oof, March bags for you. And I have some that will be ready to ship. And I think I might also offer these as a pre-order uh, just because I am really enjoying these fabrics and they feel just like very appropriate uh, to the season. So um, yeah, we'll see. If they don't sell, then I won't do a pre-order. But if they sell, we'll do a pre-order. Um, okay, the soundscape got a little intense. So <laughs> I'll try that again. So first up, I will have this print in both large wedge and sweater sizes. And you can see why maybe I'd be okay with sewing some more of these. Right. How great is this with the artichoke and the hedgy and the peas? I don't even like snakes, but this is enjoyable as part of your scape. And then here it is in the sweater size. Oh, look at this guy. Look at some pepper. Isn't it just the best? Such a fun print and maybe a color story that I really enjoy, maybe. And then I also have these guys. So these are available in all three, so all of my three primary sizes. So it'll be large wedge, sweater, and Aaron sweater. And like, right, you got your little croft hoose. great is that? So I tried to make a cute scape for you, but I'm gonna just bang my head into this silly nonsense the whole time. Right. How great. Oh, it's so enjoyable. Going to Nana's house. So again, those will all be March 15th, 9 p.m. Eastern. I'll do um, some will be ready to ship. And then if those are very popular, I will do a pre-order as well. That's I always forget to say these things. Um, so yeah. Then. Oh, so much to talk about. Okay, so let's do shenanigans. So last weekend, I was lucky enough to get to go to a local quilt show. It was in Bloomington, Indiana. So that's about 45-ish minutes away from me. Ooh, this is interesting. About 45-ish minutes away from me. And um, the quilt show was really lovely, but I also took a class on big stitch quilting. Now, I had pretty much decided that I might just not be a hand quilter, right? Like I've tried it on several different occasions. Um, the big stitch, not like the stand, like not tinies, but like big stitch quilting. Um, and I've tried it on several occasions and I just gotten to the point where I was like, this may be just not something I enjoy. Every time I've tried it, I've been like, really wanted to enjoy it. Like I love the idea of it, but I haven't actually enjoyed the process of it. I love the look of it. That's Susan B. Anderson. Her beautiful big stitch quilting, so gorgeous. Um, 
So I think it's beautiful. I love the idea of it, but I just have not enjoyed the process. And I have not done very much, right? I've just done, I think I've maybe finished one project and started, um, started and stopped several others. But I thought, and I had even decided in our Discord group that I was like, I'm done. Maybe this is just not for me. Um, but a friend of mine was like, I'm gonna take this class. And I was like, you know what? Let's give it a go. I've never had an actual class in it. And I am so glad to say it's stuck. Um, so my class I took with, with Jillian Fitzgerald. Um, and it was an all day class, which was kind of wild. I was surprised. It could have definitely been a half day class. And I think even on her instructional, instructional materials, she says half day or full day class. Half day would have been perfect. Full day was fine. Uh, it just left more time for like sitting and stitching, which I was not upset about. Um, but it was really good. So here I finished something. So part of the class is that you were to bring like, um, I think it was called big stitching on mini quilts or on tiny quilts or something like that. So you're supposed to bring a project that was at least 20 inches square. Um, and they could be, you know, anything as long as it was that size. And I think I showed you last time, or did I just do that on discord where I showed you, um, here, I'll show it to you here just in case. Uh, I showed you, I was going to make this like carpet bag. These patches are from Addy best studio and I love them so much. She does linoleum prints on these beautiful linen patches. And I had just done this sort of like scrappy, um, wonky little doodad to make um, a bag with. And, but then I kind of got chicken and I thought maybe this is like a little bit too busy to try to bring for the class. Um, and so I decided I had from a quilt that I made last spring, I guess, ish or last summer um i had these leftover piano keys blocks because i did these piano keys around the border and i thought you know what i'll just piece those together i had this solid and stash it's kind of just like a peachy um solid it's an i think it's um i think it's one of the art gallery solids and i thought you know what i'll just piece this up and i'll use it like as a pillow and i did the big stitch quilting on it and i really think it turned out super cute Okay, you can see it a little tiny bit better. You can see definitely the border because it's definitely wonky. Um, but yeah, it was really enjoyable. Here's like my little blippy side. Oh my goodness. I didn't specifically choose colors that would look great on the podcast. Shame on me. Um, okay, so the windows are open, which also means the dogs are like hyper aware of the world outside this house and so therefore are making lots of noises um so there will be uh, quite a bit of stopping and i will try not to get so frustrated <laughs> if you were here it'd be no big deal you are here but you know what i mean if you were here in body and not just in spirit um anyway so in the class, she gives you um, some needles to work with. She gives you a, a choice of pearl cotton that she has. Um, and then she gives you a quilting stencil and, and then like some marking pencils as well. So mine is not super high contrast. So you I did not specifically choose it to be photo ready. I'll try to put a picture in here. Maybe we'll see. So this is the needle that she uses um, and they are labeled as sashiko needles, um, but there's a huge variation in that. Like some sashiko needles are very thin um, because actually sashiko is typically just used with one layer of fabric or sometimes two, but it's not like a batting typically. Um, but these needles are pretty chonky. And I think I was using too thin of a needle and it was just making it hard or than it needed to be. Uh, and the other thing I was doing is I was trying to do like a traditional um, hand quilting where you rock, you do rocking motion and you stack stitches up. And she recommends that you just do one stitch at a time. She says that that's what she does. 
and that really worked better for me uh, because when you stack up the stitches it's the, the needle is strong enough um, but it's harder to catch all of your layers like your batting your top your batting and your backing um, because of the angle that you're going in usually um, so she like you just 90 degrees down and then like anyway take our class <laughs> but just doing one stitch at a time really worked well for me um, using this is specifically the pearl cotton that she uses um, it's wonderful pearl cotton this one is called peach fuzz I think which is what I used which you can see why it's probably a little bit harder to see on the quilt um, but I was very pleased I, and the quilting stencil I think when I had done big stitch quilting before, I was always just doing straight line, which is, there's nothing wrong with straight line. I actually really prefer straight line stitching, like on my quilts, at least I do at this point in my life. Um, like when I'm machine quilting. But the beauty of using a, a quilting stencil is that it be, takes the decision making out of the process. Like there are no decisions to make once you put your stencil down. So you trace your stencil. I used, um, Frixion markers. Well, Frixion makes like a marker. It makes a fine, or a, I don't know, a marker. It makes like a fine line marker. And it makes an ink pen, like a roller ball, not a roller ball, like a ballpoint kind of one. Um, and I liked the Frixion to do my stencil with. She had, she uses like water soluble pencils. I think they're Derwin's. Um, but anyway, so just finding what works for you. And then once I traced my stencil out, it was like, Oh, now I can just stitch. I don't have to decide what I'm going to do at every point. I think it was also helpful in like spreading my stitching out because I think if I were to do this like just freehand, I would have probably stitched like through each little bar. And so it would have been a lot more stitching um, and therefore it would have taken longer. Anyway, it's a whole thing. So the combination of using the stencil, which I would have never even thought about. You so I am 45 and like I remember quilting since when I was a kid but I've not seen them like forever they're still out there um but now people do more um they do less hand quilting and they do more like having things long armed and stuff there's less stencils where they use um like free motions like rulers and things like that to do their stitching with is I think maybe why, or maybe I just didn't see them because I've not been looking for them because it didn't occur to me that that's something that I would want, use, or need. But the combination of those things, yay! I really enjoyed the process. And I just stitch in hand. I don't, the other thing I was very intimidated by was like trying to use a hoop um, or something to stretch a frame, what have you, uh, because I don't like trying to I like to be able to move the material and not my body, right? Like it's much easier for me um, to just move this versus trying to contort myself to get like good angles to do stitching with. So that was the other reason I was kind of like, uh. I mean, I definitely knew you could do um, stitching in hand without any sort of frame or what have you, but just between like not knowing how to hold it and just having a simple, like just being able to watch somebody say, oh, okay, if you're in the middle of the quilt, you just put it in your hand and then you do this and then you hold it and you stitch. It's like, oh, that's not that complicated, but just like those, those ergonomic things, it's super helpful to have that as an in-person class, or at least it was for me. So hooray, I'm very pleased. Um, this is going to be a pillow because it'll match my quilt. And so this, I did the backing. This I just machine quilted because it's the back. <laughs> but I had this like fun little fat corner that I just trimmed down so it'd be square and then put, um, it's not the same peach, but whatever in the neighborhood, um, border around it. And then I'll use that for a pillow. And I just did a two inch grid um, with some random peach thread I have. Why did I have peach 50 weight thread? I don't know, 40 weight thread, excuse me. But for some reason I did, and I was happy to have it. 
So yay! That was excellent. Hey. Um, so then also in stitching, I have a finished object. Are you guys ready? This is a work in progress. It's now finished. That is older than my child. It predates me living in this house. I don't know when on earth, but I finished. Oh, I finished it. Can you believe? So this is from the chart um, Twall Rooster by Birds of a Feather, which I bought at a shop called Scarlet Thistle, which no longer exists because I don't even know where it is. I have no idea where that shop was. Do you live in Ohio? Do you remember this shop? I can only imagine that that's where it's from. Maybe Waynesville? I don't even know. Um, but so yeah, Birds of a Feather. This is a discontinued chart, or a, no longer in print. So... At one point I lost the chart and couldn't find it. I thought, oh, I'll just go buy a new one. People are charging like $300 for it. Not that anybody's getting that, but um, it was originally $7. <laughs> the uh, original pattern is written for Weeks Dye Works. I just used DMC Black. Um, and then I did use different color for the chickens for their little legs and their combs or their roosters because the colors that I don't, they probably have changed because the colors that were, uh, it was written for, actually feet I used the same, but this color was like hot coral, like, woo, like it was a super fun color, uh, but not really, it just did not, it did not, I did not enjoy the vibe. I know, right? Such a dork, but I'm like so excited that it's done. And there's definitely errors. So many errors, but I don't care. Okay. <laughs> so that is finished, which is a very exciting. I have no idea what that fabric is. I think it's like Swigert or something. Um, because I don't, I can't imagine that. I definitely would not have bought like a hand dyed fabric then. Um, because like, I don't even know where I would have found one, but also it would have just not been in my budget. <laughs> so yeah. And then I have also started, oh my gosh, this is so cute. It's ridiculous. This is by Stacy Nash Designs. She's a, li a line of um, little fellas called Animal Crackers. And I have started Henrietta. Do you see her? So they're just like little like pillow, like basically they're stitched as like a little pillow. She doesn't even have... Yeah, they're not even stand-ups. I think I'll make mine a stand-up, meaning I'll put like a base on it so it'll stand. Um, but how cute is she? <laughs> right. So this is what I have so far. <laughs> Whatever. It's her little dress. So I think their finished size is like three by seven or something. They're very, they're pretty small. Um, but they're very charming. There is a rabbit, there are several rabbits. And the reason I even found these is because with the Nashville show that happened recently, uh, she's released a few more and I was like, oh, what is that? Also, there's a snail. Y'all, the snail is so hecka charming. I might need to make the snail too. We'll see how this goes. Um, I'm using the called for threads. I think these are all weeks, yeah. But the, the fabric, I'm not using the called for fabric um, because I just, like each one of them uses a different fabric and I was like, okay, settle down. So <laughs> I'll buy the ridiculous threads, but I'm not buying all those fabrics. So I'm just using, I don't remember which one it is, but so there's all the threads. Boop. But yeah, so cute. Um, I did photocopy the chart and blow it up because my eyes are aged. Um, but the nice thing is it's pretty much 
like a fill-in kind of a situation. Like there's not a ton of counting after you kind of establish it um, because the A it's small and then it's sort of solid. So there's not a lot of breaks in it. Um, so yeah. So that's happening. I'm just looking at my 12 rooster again. He's just over there being so charming. And then last time, I think I told you about these crazy eggs that I have decided I must make. Have I ever, okay, have I in years past been like, who would put egg ornaments up? Yes, I have. Apparently the answer was you in the future, you dummy. So this is a pattern called Modern Folk Easter Eggs. And it is by Hannah Schneider. Like, can we just discuss her color sense? So good. She tells you the colors of all of the, um, of the ones that she has on her, her tree, her tree. Um, and she uses all felt from Binzi design. Some of it is a hundred percent wool. Some of it is a blend of wool and polyester. Um, but I mean, like, Forsythia branch. I think we tried this last time. Uh, she has Forsythia branches that she's hanging hers off of. So um, I have so far finished four. I gave one away. Sorry, friend, that I gave it away. I didn't stuff yours enough. And so it's a little bit less egg shaped and more squared off. But you know, whatever. These things we learn. So here's what one looks like. It's like four little panels and you do the same embroidery on each of the four panels. And then you just whip stitch the little dude together and stuff it. And like you can use the little cutoffs that you like the leftovers, you know, that you're trimming. So when you cut, so, okay, these are so many words I say. So you can print the pattern onto Fabrisolve or whatever it's called. And then, can you see that? Oh, yeah, there you go. And then you do your little stitchy stitch and you can do it in a hoop. The first one I did in a hoop. But the other ones I've just done in hand. Um, I do like doing the French knots in a hoop better, but everything else I prefer just to do in hand. Um, and also felt is kind of thick for a hoop. It's a little bit like, Oof. so anyway, so you do your little stitching and then you cut them out. And the nice thing is, is you can use all those little pits that you trimmed off just as stuffing. And then I also needed additional stuffing, but it makes you feel like oh, virtuous for not wasting the things. Um, so then like, here's one of mine that's in progress that I'm stitching. So then I'll cut out the egg shape, give it a bath to, to dissolve this amazing stuff that you can run through the printer, but then dissolves in water. It's magic y'all. And then you whip stitch it together and you got this. So you can see I have this one here and I have this one here. Right? This one is very charming as well. And I'm officially like, somebody's Nana now. <laughs> My mamma never had eggs on a tree. So I mean, but I'm just saying. And then this one is more of like a tone on tone story. She's a tone on tone girl. Uh, but also just terribly cute. And you don't feel like you're stitching. You use three strands of embroidery or three strands of like a six strand DMC. So it's like, uh, they go fairly quickly, not like super speedy, but fairly quickly. And it doesn't feel like it has to be perfect, you know, cause it's an egg. You're going to hang on some pussy willows or some forsythia. Cause you're crazy. <laughs> And then it's going to bob distractingly in the background while you do a podcast because that's just how you roll. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I've really enjoyed those quite a lot. So this color. And then again, I showed you this kind of like mustardy one that I have and I've got some peachier and then I've got a good green. That's like darker version of this. It's very enjoyable. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this and I'm probably not even going to finish one. I've got three, four completed one. Let's get away. And then two other ones that are pretty much, so I mean, maybe I'll, I, 
not gonna lie to you, I was even like, maybe I'll just make some little like calico eggs to go in there as well. Just some small guys to kind of pepper it up a little. Who am I? Apparently I'm a person who is excited that there is sunshine. I always get, I'm always so happy when it's dark. Like when we have this winter solstice, I get a little sad because I'm like, oh, light's coming back. But then about this time of year, I'm like, oh, that's right. <laughs> bodies are kind of made to enjoy some sunshine. <laughs> so yeah, so there's this eggs I'm working on. And then what else? Okay, so then knitting. I feel like there was something else I was supposed to tell you, but I'm sure I'll remember as soon as I turn off this camera. I finished some socks. What? I did. So this yarn is from Knit Spin Farm. This is their Tarkey fingering, which is 90% superwash Tarkey, 10% nylon. This is their Backyard Bowels color. Um, and they currently have some pre-orders up for this month's club, for this month's colors, and they are all lovely. So yeah, look how cute, and there's little Twizzler socks. This is one of my favorites to do. Um, I apologize, I don't recall the make the designer, but they're Twizzler socks. They're just like a, and I th believe it's a free pattern. Um, and then I just do an afterthought heel because that's my jam. So yeah, I finished those guys. And then I cast on some new socks. This is a pattern by the beautiful Marsh who is known as Hay Brownberry. They are called Now and Next. Cuff down. I'm trying to see if she has, she has Hay Brownberry on her pattern. So I think that that's probably, but her name is Marceline Smith. And she's delightful and wonderful and amazing. And here's my baby sock. <laughs> hmm, it's quite baby. see a little bit maybe uh maybe it's too baby for you uh and this is just a stitch marker i made with a little mushroom lamp work bead um so i am knitting this with strong sport by hey ooh, by another crafty girl you know sometimes it's helpful if i just do things so this is strong sport this is her colorway through the chasm so it's 80% superwash merino, 20% nylon, three ply, 328 yards for 100 grams. And I know it's ridiculous, but I am knitting them on double zeros, even though they're sport weight, because, because there are reasons. Um, I don't know. It just, I am a, I'm a loose knitter to begin with. Um, and then I do like my socks at a pretty good, firm gauge. I mean, I would like them to even be a firmer gauge than they are, but I can only knit so tightly without my hands being like, what are you doing to us? Oh, so I should show you Sarah's yarn in the ball. This is just like half of it because I had a winding snafu. But isn't that beautiful? I'm not even like a purple person. And yet here we are. So that is that. And then I am also knitting, I don't know if I've shown you this before. This is a Musselboro. So that pattern is by Isolde, which everybody's knitting because it's super fun to knit. So this is yarn that I purchased in Champagne, 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 Urbana Champagne. And this is, so this is the second color. The first color I've just finished one ball and then I decided to do a different colorway so that it would be reversible and fun. Uh, and then I just one pearl row that's not in the pattern, but I like the one pearl row when you're halfway, it just gives it an easier flip. Like when you fold it in on itself, it just flips together better, which I prefer. I shouldn't say it flips together better. It just, I like it better that way. Um, but so this is the second colorway. 
This is Shopple Wool Edition 3. And they're each 50 gram balls. I think it's listed as a DK, but I think it's definitely more of a sport. Um, one colorway is Rosetta, and one colorway is Garten Dog. So Rosetta is this one, and then Garten Tag is this one, which I'm assuming is a garden of some sort because it has got like very much, again with the purple, who am I? I don't know. I just don't know. And I am knitting that on US one and a halfs, yes, US one and a halfs, which are two and a half millimeters. I do, um, I took this to knit at a movie and I like, like when I'm going out and about, I kind of like to do this more as a magic loop. Um, but when I'm home, I do prefer it on 16 inches. And the only reason I like it sort of as a magic loop when I'm out and about is because it's less likely to fall off its needles. Um, and I know you can get stoppers like Jelby and, and lots of other great makers make little stoppers, but then I always forget to do that. Um, but yeah. And I didn't say, but I'm knitting my sock on carbons. If uh, if I'm going to knit on double points, I almost always use carbons. I just like them. Um, I know some folks don't love this like transition from the tip to the carbony part, but it doesn't bother me. Um, and they're the only ones in the double zeros and triple zeros that don't bend super easily for me. Okay, then like that's all oh oh I did take some video of some quilt blocks that I have finished so I finished piecing all my blocks for this um, 36 patch quilt so I will put those in here if I remember so just pretend that there's some fun ambient music here there's something clever happening in the soundscape but I don't know what it is because the whole copyright thing with YouTube is too much for my brain to navigate. And I know other people have figured it out and clearly I need to call one of them, but I don't know who they are or how to call them. And my brain just can't take it right now. So pretend ambient music is happening and that I don't have a thread on my carpet that you can see very glaringly in the upper right hand corner. But you know, that's me. Ta-da! So yeah, I need to actually like do a layout of like how that's going to get put together. Um, so that is on my plate. I am also working on some flying geese that I am going to do for my table in here. Um, so I'll have that hopefully next time. Um, I sort of have to put this down to show you, but I'll just show you next time. Um, what else? Oh, I should have said that sooner. Okay, you're still here. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion part deux. Um, I'm also gonna do like a spring cleaning update on April 1st. So I've got this March 15th update that's happening. And then on April 1st, again, 9 p.m. Eastern, again, fatsquillfibers.com, I'm gonna do like a spring cleaning update. So it'll be um, little bits and bobs I've put aside from the year. So it'll be like, lots of times when I'm making pre-orders or things like that, I'll end up with a little bit of extra fabric and I just kind of hold on to it. Um, because I'd hate to do just like a bag with one or two, or excuse me, an update with one or two of something. But I'm going to go ahead and do that April 1st so that I can free up some space in my house and mind. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that'll be April 1st. And then that's all of the making, but that's a lot of making. I've been feeling good about my making. I know that there is less knitting than you're used to, or like that I have historically done, but I know you'll see, like you've seen as the years have gone by, I've done some more stitching. I'm just trying to be a little bit more true to myself and what I want to make, because when I try to force myself to make stuff, like it just, it doesn't, you know, right? Like it just, 
it doesn't, it's not as joyful. And I think part of this making is that it needs to be joyful for me. And I hope that you are finding joy in your making. Um, so thank you for like coming along with me as like my interests change and they grow and they go off onto tangents and they come back. I don't think I'll ever not be a capital K knitter. Like I've been knitting since 1996 and I love knitting it's just one of those things where as time goes on like other things um kind of like catch your imagination catch your creative flow um and also like there's a a joy in making stitcheries and things like that that occupy less space in my life um until I learn how to move knitting on in a way that makes sense to me um stitching it kind of takes that stress of the making off like the end stress like oh sorry I just kicked you I hope so thank you for being along coming along with me as I as I do different things um what am I reading so I finished several things I think I'm going to try to talk more about the Gabor Mate um book next time because I've, I've almost finished it but not quite and I've definitely not digested it enough um, things I have finished since we talked to last since we talked last um, I finished sisterhood the secret history of women in the CIA by Liza Mundy and that was just something that was interesting to listen and, and learn about because I don't know anything about women in the CIA at all um, I would recommend it if you're interested. You know, there's, it's hard to listen. Sometimes it's hard. Individuals are interesting to learn about. I mean, almost always, but sometimes the structures they exist in are so problematic that you're like, oh, I feel conflicted. But neither, none, neither here nor there. If you're interested, I, I found it very pleasant. I listened to that audiobook. Um, I finished listening to In My Own Moccasins, a memoir of resilience by Helen Knott. Um, yeah, woof. Long listed for the 2020 RBC Taylor Prize, a memoir of addiction, intergenerational trauma, and the lasting wounds of sexual violence, Helen Knott, a highly accomplished indigenous woman, seems to have it all, but in her memoir, she offers a different perspective. And my own moccasins is an unflinching account of addiction, intergenerational trauma, and the wounds brought on by sexual violence. It is also the story of sisterhood, the power of ceremony, the love of family, and the possibility of redemption. With gripping moments of withdrawal, times of spiritual awareness and historical insights going back to the signing of Treaty 8 by her great-great-grandfather, Chief Bigfoot, her journey exposes the legacy of colonialism while reclaiming her spirit. So the writing is really well, con beautifully constructed, um, but it does, for me anyway, I it definitely had to be put down and then I had to revisit um, because it is so powerful and vulnerable, deeply, deeply vulnerable. And all that entails, like it has these intense, intense moments of darkness, intense moments of lightness. Um, and just a vital memoir. So I am thankful for the author. Um, yeah. Um, I also finished reading Southernmost by Silas House. Um, I had never heard of this author before. A friend of mine was at an Appalachian Studies conference and she just happened to mention him. Um, I don't read as many books, uh, especially fiction or um things like that by men, but 
I really, I, I did really enjoy it. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed like the overall story of it. I enjoyed the timing of it. I enjoyed, um, the, the narrative, like just path, but I also just really enjoyed like the sort of like small, like nostalgic Southern things. Um, I'm not Southern, but my family are from Kentucky. So these sort of just like Appalachian things that are kind of woven in, um, that felt very comforting and home-like. So here's the synopsis. In the stunning novel about judgment, courage, heartbreak, and change, author Silas House wrestles with the limits of belief and the infinite ways to love. In the aftermath of a flood that washes away much of a small Tennessee town, evangelical preacher Asher Sharp offers shelter to two gay men. In doing so, he starts to see his life anew and risks losing everything. His wife, locked into her religious prejudices, his congregation, which shuns Asher after he delivers a passionate sermon in defense of tolerance, and his young son, Justin, caught in the middle of what turns into a bitter custody battle. With no way out but ahead, Asher takes Justin and flees to Key West, where he hopes to find his brother Luke, whom he turned against years ago after Luke came out. And it is there, at the southernmost point of the county country, that Asher and Justin discover a new way of thinking about the world, a new way of understanding love. Southernmost is a tender and affecting book, a meditation on love, atonement, forgiveness, and reconciliation. So that's the only thing I read by him, but I would definitely read more. Um, yeah. Uh, I also finished Big Swiss, Big Swiss by Jen Began. These books are all over the place, but that's kind of what I enjoy. Um, so Big Swiss by Jen Began. I tell you, I love to sometimes read the um, Goodreads reviews after I've read the book because they're all like about the the main character is highly problematic. Um, here, I'll read. A brilliant original and funny novel about a sex therapist transcriptionist who falls in love with a client while listening to her sessions. When they accidentally meet in real life, an explosive affair ensues. Greta lives with her friend Sabine in an ancient Dutch farmhouse in Hudson, New York. She spends her days transcribing therapy sessions for a sex coach who calls himself Ohm. She becomes infatuated with his newest client, a repressed married woman she affectionately refers to as Big Swiss, since she's tall, stoic, and originally from Switzerland. They both have dark histories, but Big Swiss chooses to remain unattached to her suffering while Greta continues to be tortured by her past. One day, Greta recognizes Big Swiss's voice at the dog park. In a panic, she introduces herself with a fake name, and they quickly become enmeshed. Although Big Swiss is unaware of Greta's true identity, Greta has never been more herself with anyone. Bold, outlandish, and filled with irresistible characters, Big Swiss is both a love's health, both a love story, and also a deft examination of infidelity, mental health, sexual stereotypes, and more from an amazingly talented, one of kind voice in contemporary Vic fiction. So this, I think, this is a Goodreads review by someone named Jennifer. And I think this is a pretty good encapsulation. Began has managed to create characters whose quirkiness stops just short of being obnoxious or try hard, and a story that's so fast paced and bizarrely fun that it leaves the reader with a sense of exhilaration by the end. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And I listened to it like shock. I mean, I just listened to it like in a few days. Um, it's, it's kind of a wild ride. But and again, I love those people who are like this, this character's so terrible it's just so does so many crazy things i'm like it's just like it's very human <laughs> and like i feel like i have trouble watching things like weeds where the characters make so many bad decisions and like you like i get so stressed out right like that there's some i don't know what that line is for me um Maybe it's the violence aspect that's the line. I don't know. But this is another one where you're like, she's making terrible decisions one after another. But the stakes don't feel as, like, intense as... I, I, I haven't watched Weeds in forever. Like, I think I watched, like, season one and a half. And it was just like, this is too... I can't... I need to stop. 
or even the Jason Bateman the Ozarks one. I was like, you just, you're just making terrible. I can't be with you in these decisions that are just, I, it's stressing me out. This one did not stress me out. I was just like, oh, <laughs> that's probably not going to go well for you. <laughs> so yeah, maybe it's the, the violence versus just like, ooh, um, that makes it more tolerable for me. I don't know. Um, but so that's Big Swiss by Jen Began. It's a uh, not safe for work listen. Thank you for being patient with the crazy backlighting. Um, my partner just came home and so I like ran upstairs to keep recording and apparently took off my sweater, which I forgot. <laughs> no continuity. Yeah, yeah. So the last thing I'll talk about is Filter World. This is How Algorithms Flattened Culture by Kyle Chaika. Chaika, I apologize, not sure which. Um, or maybe none at all. Uh, I listened to this book, but also had the hard copy at hand. Um, and so I own the hard copy. I love the idea of doing the commonplace book uh, or something like a commonplace book where you actually physically write out the quotes or the points or condense what's meaningful to you or important to you. Um, I love the idea of doing it to slow myself down. Um, but I just have not gotten to that place yet. So I still kind of am relying on annotating actual physical book copies, even though this one, for example, I think I could have gone with a commonplace approach where I, I look back through and there's not tons and tons of highlights. Uh, but I think I should also do that just to help me sort of reflect and digest some of the book a little bit more, which is kind of what I do with you, but uh, maybe more in depth um, than what we do here. I'll read you the blip. From trendy restaurants to city grids to TikTok and Netflix feeds the world round algorithm recommendations dictate our experiences and choices. The algorithm is present in the familiar neon signs and exposed brick of internet cafes, whether in Nairobi or Portland, and the skeletal modern furniture of Airbnbs in cities big and small. Over the last decade, this network of mathematically determined decisions has taken over almost unnoticed, informing the songs we listen to, the friends with whom we stay in touch, as we've grown increasingly accustomed to our insipid new normal. This ever-tightening web woven by algorithms is called Filter World. Kalcheka shows us how on online and offline spaces alike shows us how online and offline spaces alike have been engineered for seamless consumption, becoming a source of pervasive anxiety in the process. Pervasive anxiety. Users of, users of technology have been forced to contend with data-driven equations that try to anticipate their desires and often get them wrong. What results is a state of docility that allows tech companies to curtail human experiences, human lives for profit. But to have our tastes, behaviors, and emotions governed by computers, while convenient, does nothing short of call the very notion of free will into question. Chica traces this creeping machine-guided curation as it infiltrates the furthest reaches of our digital, physical, and psychological spaces, with algorithms increasingly influencing not just what culture we consume, but what culture is produced. Urgent questions arise. What happens when shareability supersedes messiness, innovation, and creativity? The qualities that make us human. What does it mean to make a choice when the options have been so carefully arranged for us? Is personal freedom possible on the internet? So this book was surprising to me. I mean, I felt like I kind of was like, okay, I think I know what the, the algorithm is. I feel like I know lots of problems with the algorithm. We look at things like how easy, for example, it is for folks to find themselves in alt-right spaces where that's not, you know, like how quickly that those things can um, uh, guide your path without you being aware of it. But this goes even further into things thinking about Again, like what culture is even available for us to consume? Like how much of creativity and what's out there is driven by algorithm and not, not nefariously, not, you know, in like a greedy way, but just when an artist creates something, like if she sees that it, you know, one thing is wildly more popular in terms of exposure, um, 
that that guides what she's going to make, right? Or like sometimes it's like you have to make things to even like have your voice heard over the din. Um, so while social media and things like that create these spaces that, which I always love the thought of like, again, this like sort of um, public access, right? Like these are real humans doing real things. The reality is that for folks to um, be seen and be heard across larger spaces, then these algorithms really influence not just what you're seeing, but what they are making. Um, and so it talks a little bit about like, you know, how is your taste curated? Like, why do you decide what you like and don't like? And I was, that was a surprising thing to me to think that this book went into that I just hadn't thought about, right? Like, I mean, I feel like you have this sense that like you're discovering things and you're like liking things because you like them. But how much of that is because that's what your eyeballs are have access to or because what you're seeing over and over again. Um, and so yeah, it was just kind of, it was a little unsettling. I'm not going to lie, uh, but really interesting read. Um, so this is one of the things I highlighted. Building your own sense of taste, that set of subconscious principles by which you identify what you like is an uphill battle compared to passively consuming whatever content feeds deliver to you. Dot, 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 dot. Today, we have more cultural options available to us than ever, and they are accessible on demand. We are free to choose anything, yet the choice we often make is to not have a choice, to have our purview shaped by automated feeds, which may be based on the aggregate actions of humans, but are not human in themselves. So, right, this idea of it takes work or it, ta you know, it's, it's much more active to try to go out and find things you like. I mean, I can just remember like being excited about a book series because it's like, Oh, thank goodness. I like this series. I don't have to make a choice for like eight more books. Right. But like that taken to like such an extreme, like that going further and further and further because it's like, Oh, well, this is what Netflix like, Oh, how fun that there's these things that Netflix recommends me. But that also means that like, I don't really know how to find other things, right? Like I know that that's, or she, he talks a lot about um, Spotify and music apps and things like that. Like that, like, yeah, there's this like beautiful thing of convenience of like, Oh, I don't have to try to think about how to make a mix of these things. I'm not standing by my radio and hitting the, the record button or even just trying to find new artists and things like that. Cause they're already curated for me. But like, what do we sacrifice for that? Um, which I kind of was like, that was the thing that was surprising that I had not, did not expect to be thinking about, um, with this book. So just to touch base quickly, uh, back to In My Own Moccasins by Helen Knott. Uh, I didn't do it 1% of the justice it deserves. Um, but this is a knitting podcast and it's a book that's not written for me. Um, but I'm thankful that it's there and I was able to read it. Um, so yeah, just, just like it deserves more space than I have the ability to convey. Maybe that's right. Um, and also I forgot to say goodbye. So talk to you next